Hi there. This is just a quick video showing some uh, performance upgrades you can do to your Esheen Racer 250. Uh, I'll cover changing the camera angle and why you might want to do that even if you think it's fine. Um, talk about using different lights for safety reasons. Um, talk about securing the platform so you don't lose your investment. Talk about enabling PWM sync on your ESCs. Tuning your PIDs using Optune or OPNG Tune as it's now called and using settings banks to switch between various PID settings. So as you shed your beginner skin and uh, start to fly faster, you'll want to change the camera angle so it points more upwards so you can see more than just the ground when you're flying at a decent forward speed. But there's a reason you might want to change it even before you're ready for that. Being in the center position, it puts the most strain on the joint. And right here, there's less than a centimeter of plate between the camera and where it slots in the bottom and this edge here. Like I said, I'm not sure if I can get it in shot because of the booms. Right around here you can see it start to bend up. So for that reason it makes sense to move the camera from this vertical position sooner rather than later. You're going to want it there eventually probably and you'll be reducing the strain on this bottom plate. So to do that just unscrew these two bolts, position your camera as desired and tighten them back down again. And you'll need a two millimeter X wrench to do that. Alright. Oh, there we go. Alright, I'm going to try it there. By the fact that we've reduced the height that was pinching between these two plates um, by moving it back, we'll, have, we'll be putting less strain on there. So in my previous video, I showed how to remove the tail light so you can fit in bigger batteries. And at that time, I hadn't yet wired in this JST connector. I'll show you quickly. To the R terminal, wired the negative lead and the positive terminal, the red lead, obviously. And uh, JST connector runs a bunch of very small wire, 36 gauge, I think. Out to some of these uh, strip LEDs that are used in sections of three. And one of those sections per boom I find to be plenty. Fairly little current draw as well. Anyway, there's a safety reason you might want to do that for it. And that's if something goes wrong with your FPV gear, you need to be able to fly it in line of sight. Even 100 meters away, you'll find it pretty hard. And the red light and the white headlights are helpful, but you'll find the red green lighting much more so. And Telemetry recovered. usually light. you can see at least three of these boom lights at any time. And that gives you its orientation. If green's on the left, you're behind it. Green's on the right, you're in front of it. So flying more aggressively, you'll find yourself zooming around trees and stuff because it's fun. And you will crash. And when you do, this camera platform could come loose. These aren't held in by anything more than the rubber they're made of. Having a ridge on it here going through a small hole. So they could just fail entirely or they could pop out. So you want to protect whatever's attached to that platform from flying away and getting lost. And you can do that by a variety of methods. I'll show you how to do it with a bit of dental floss. Okay, so I'm just going to rip off a length of this. It's much more than I need, but it's easier that way. When I think about it, I should you should attach it near the back because you're only going to have front impacts. Well, not only, but usually. So you'd want to prevent it from coming loose and smacking around. This stuff is uh, incredibly strong, though. I wouldn't be fooled by its small size. Get something to draw it out. There we go. You're just going to want to make sure you don't tie it tight. You don't want to impede the movement of the camera platform. It's the whole point. It's supposed to be able to move independently. There we go. Now it's secured, good and strong, with almost no weight. So if you watched my previous video, you'll know that I wasn't really happy with the performance of this in a medium breeze. So tuning was necessary. And uh, you may or may not have heard of One Shot or PWM Sync. I don't know much about it. These are apparently methods that the flight controller uses to talk to the speed controller. Here's a pretty good diagram that shows the differences between them that I found on rcgroups.com. Um, basically, with standard PWM, it seems like the ESC is getting older data than the flight controller has. So the advantage of PWM sync or one shot is that it's getting more up-to-date data, I think is what it boils down to. So using CC3D, I tried one shot and it didn't work. 
but PWM sync does seem to work. So in order to do that, you have to be using PPM meaning your receiver has only one cable out to the flight controller. If you have all your wires plugged in, you're using PWM, it's not going to work. For starters, you need to change the arrangement on your plug into the CC3D. The signal line, which used to be right beside the power lines, now has to move over to the eighth plug. So with our receiver wire unplugged, the white wire used to be right next to the red wire there, and we, I had to move it to the other side in the eighth plug in order for the PWM sync to work. Next, you want to plug in your mini B USB cable to the mini quad. Open up ground control station. It should connect automatically. And you want to go to the configuration screen, the hardware section, and your receiver port. Change it to PPM pin 8 plus one shot. And hit save. Then go to the output section and change the first two banks to PWM sync. Hit save. And you're good to go. So PWM sync might give you a better locked in feeling flying your quad, but the real performance improvements are going to come when you start changing your PIDs. And if you haven't heard of PIDs, well, you're in for a rude awakening. They're a pain to deal with. But the Open Pilot people created something pretty neat called Optune. It's now called OPNG Tune. And essentially what that is is you figure out a couple values, which I'll explain in a minute, and you plug them into their calculator and you'll get back some PID settings to plug into the ground control station. The values that you need to get are called unique oscillation value. And that means for every quad, based on how, you know, what kind of motors it has and how heavy the battery is and center of gravity and moment of inertia and things like that, it'll have a specific P value that makes it oscillate. If I was doing the roll, maybe it would be oscillating like this. Now, since the Open Pilot Wiki is down right now, I'll give you a quick explanation on how to do this. So the first thing we need to do is configure the transmitter to change a value with a potentiometer. And you do that on the TX PID section. Click Enable. Telemetry lost. Unplug everything. And plug it back in again. Telemetry recovered. And so to get your UOV, your unique oscillating value, we do roll and pitch separately, so we'll do roll first. And you just zero out the integral and the derivative. And then this is the value that we're going to change with the potentiometer until our mini quad is in a stable oscillation, meaning it's not leveling out and then the oscillations aren't getting worse. You need to configure your transmitter to output a potentiometer on one of these accessory channels. And we will use channel 6 on the transmitter. And what we want to select is roll rate KP. Basically, we know this isn't going to start oscillating, so we'll start here at 0 0.00165. And we'll go up to 0 0.01, hit save. Now you should be able to see this. Armed. It has to be armed, but now you can see that at the bottom, pretty much 0 0.00165 up to 0 0.01. Okay, so with the potentiometer at the bottom, take it outside, slowly increase it until you get a steady oscillation. After you've gotten a steady oscillation, you have to land it like that, believe it or not. You can unplug the quad, you can turn off the transmitter, but don't move the potentiometer. That's the value you need to read. Okay, so when you come back in and plug in your quad, turn everything back on, arm it, you'll be able to see your unique oscillation value. And then repeat that process for the pitch channel. Do that by changing this to pitch rate KP. You'll want this to start from the default and go up to something bigger. When you're done determining the UOVs for roll and pitch, you can disable the transmitter PID module, as well as your accessory channel. So these are the UOVs I got. I tried it for each of my two battery sizes, and you can see they differ a little bit. Less so for roll, and that makes sense, because the moment of inertia on that axis isn't going to change much with changing the battery. So I'm going to use 0 0.006 for my roll, and 0 0.008 for my pitch UOV. So go to optune.opng.org to use the Optune calculator. You choose your ESC type. I'm using PWM Sync. Your flight style, I'm going to try Sport Flyer for now. And your yaw style, and then enter in your UOVs. So the use PID bank 
means you can have three sets of PIDs stored and switch between them mid-flight if you have a switch configured for it. I'm going to keep the default eSheen PIDs on PID Bank 1. I'm going to use these ones on PID Bank 2. So download the UAVO file and go back to OpenPilot GCS and import UAV settings. You might have to switch your file type to XML to select it and click Save to Board Flash. Now on the flight mode switch settings, you want to use the same flight mode for each position and then switch the banks to keep things consistent so you know what differences you're observing are due to the PID settings and not some flight mode settings. And if we compare these to the factory defaults, 0 0.00165, 0 0.00340, and so on. They're all quite a bit higher than the factory defaults. And I found the flight to be much more stable. Much, much, much better. I can't tell you how pleased I am with this Optune calculator. One other thing I wanted to mention quickly, because I learned the hard way, is that if you have settings enabled that the board doesn't support, it's not going to arm. So anytime you're changing settings in here, it's best to check if you can still arm your quad before you go out to the flying field. I had enable pirouette compensation on and saved to the board and I went out to the flying field and the thing wouldn't arm. So that was a wasted trip. So I was hoping to get some sweet footage showing the difference between the default and the Optune PIDs but it's kind of hard to demonstrate. Um, it was a pretty windy day and uh, you can see a few wobbles here and there. Um, a little bit right around now, um, but for the most part, uh, the default PIDs are okay. Um, my original complaint was when I had a GoPro on it, and uh, that brings up a good point. If you have a GoPro or different size batteries that you're interchanging, it makes sense to have uh, different PIDs on settings that you can switch between easily. Uh, one good way to test your PIDs is to do a rapid descent, um, and that'll typically wobble if the PIDs aren't good. Um, like I just did there and you can't really tell but um, there was a bit of a wobble. So here with the Optune PIDs it's much more locked in as they say. Um, there's very little interference from the wind. It doesn't get um, pushed around too much. Uh, here's another descent test and it's just rock solid. So very happy with the Optune PIDs and I'll continue to play around with them. Thanks for watching.